Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, it is the 14th Sunday after Pentecost, and so um, that is why we are still in the green season of the church here. We don't start switching colors up until around <coughs> Halloween, actually, but not for Halloween, for Reformation. But uh, in any case, um, welcome to our guests and visitors. Glad to have you with us today. Uh, we do have a bit of standing up and sitting down and things like that, but uh, try to have all of that in the bulletin so that way uh, you can just kind of follow along the dance steps and it'll all be good. Um, as far as the schedule goes, um, no, we'll have no Wednesday classes either this coming week or the following week. Um, just because things like uh, Labor Day are approaching as well as uh, I will be down at the district office uh, for much of the week uh, doing the, uh, the stuff with the board of directors as well as uh, district archives so that uh, uh, that's going to take up my time and uh, what I'm planning to do is spend the next couple of days getting everything ready for next Sunday, so that way uh, it all kind of is, is prepared and ready to go. And so, uh, also the, the gals group uh, will be again in the uh, first Saturday of September, which is the 7th, because the, the 1st of September is this coming Sunday. It's hard to believe that we're already through the year this far, but Time flies when you're not having fun, right? Um, anyway, the, uh, the theme uh, for the service today is uh, Jesus. The, the focus is on, on the gospel text of Jesus talking to the Pharisees and, and telling them that they, they're kind of misguided as far as how they're dealing with their rules. What, what is the Bible talking about when it gives us rules to follow? Because the popular notion is that God is, is being mean, he's being a bully uh, about all sorts of stuff, and that's not the case. As a matter of fact, what we're going to learn is that the fatherhood of God and the uh, example that he gives all fathers and sons is to protect the weak, is to protect and love and cherish their wives. And of course, Paul talks about this in Ephesians. That is to say, if the wife is supposed to follow her husband, that's because the husband is willing to protect his wife to the point of laying down his life so that she doesn't have to suffer. So uh, we'll talk about what it means for Christ and his attitude towards us, how he wants to protect us, how he wants to care for us, and how he wants to empower us to do the same for other people. So that's why the sermon, Dirty and Clean, is going to focus on uh, how people kind of misrepresent God's intentions, uh, whether it's uh, his words and, and his law or his gospel, and kind of mess those up and get them confused. And we're going to hopefully come out of it understanding that Christ is always trying to help us, always trying to protect us, and always trying to look after us, even when people in our lives are not trying to do that. And uh, therefore, that is something that we can always take heart in and uh, have being a, uh, an anchor in an otherwise turbulent world. And so the, the hymns are going to focus on the fact that there is this thing called human sin that makes the world such a crummy place. But there is also the steadfastness of God and his willingness to lead us, guide us, and guard and keep us throughout life. Uh, and so all of our hymns kind of focus on that. We'll be using uh, Divine Service Setting 4, and that starts on page 203 and otherwise. We will begin with the opening hymn, All Mankind Fell in Adam's Fall.
Horizon, turn to page 203 in the fourth part of the hymnal as we begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who made the heaven and earth? If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of his altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together, as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me. A sinner. Almighty God, God, have, have mercy, mercy upon us. us. Forgive us, us our sins, sins and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his only begotten Son to die for each and every one of you, and for his sake he forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of that same Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity, and I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. Prove me, O Lord, and try me. Test my heart and my mind. I wash my hands in innocence and go around your altar, O Lord, proclaiming thanksgiving aloud and telling all your wondrous deeds. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. O Lord, I love the habitation of your house, and the place where your glory dwells. <clears throat>
The Old Testament reading is from Isaiah chapter 29. The vision of all this has become to you like the words of a book that is sealed. When men give it to one another who can read, saying, Read this, he says, I cannot, for it is sealed. And when they give the book to one who cannot read, saying, Read this, he says, I cannot read. And the Lord said, Because this people draws near with their mouth, and honor me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me, and their fear of me is a commandment taught by men, therefore, behold, I will again do wonderful things with this people, with wonder upon wonder, and the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the discernment of their discerning men shall be hidden. Ah, you who hide deep from the Lord your counsel, whose deeds are in the dark, and who say, who sees us, who knows us. You turn things upside down. Shall the potter be regarded as the clay, that the thing made should save its maker? He did not make me, or the thing formed, say, of him who formed it. He has no understanding. It is not yet a very little while until Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field, and the fruitful field shall be regarded as a forest. In that day the deaf shall hear the words of a book, and out of their gloom and darkness the eyes of the blind shall see. The meek shall obtain fresh joy in the Lord, and the poor among mankind shall exult in the Holy One of Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from Ephesians chapter 5. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to the husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies, he who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise as we sing together the Alleluia and verse. Tradition of the elders, and when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat 
unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the traditions of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? And he said to them, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father or mother, whatever you would have gained from me is korban, that is, given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and many such things you do. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, o Christ. Together we confess the Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed on page 206. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men, and for our salvation, came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, and with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So our title is Dirty and Clean. All human cultures, from the most ancient to the most modern, have concepts of what it means to be unclean and what it means to be holy. This ranges from ensuring health and cleanliness to having a morbid fear of an almost demonic power. All major religious groups and many smaller ones, such as tribal religions, have various taboos. There are still parts of this world where especially women can be killed for breaking such taboos, and no one will prosecute the killers, even though such actions are technically illegal. Our Gospel text, Mark 7, verses 1 through 13, tells us about Jesus and the Pharisees, about what he thought about their many rules. Even today, in such matters as a woman's monthly uncleanness, Orthodox Judaism takes things to a level that goes far beyond the other Abrahamic religions. Married couples sleep in separate beds during this time. Husbands are not allowed to sit on the same couch cushion as their wives. Hold, they are not allowed to hold hands. Uh, a uh, husband may not listen to his wife sing. Uh, they cannot pass objects directly to each other. They cannot play games together. And there's a whole other raft of cannot do's during this time. And that's, that's pretty intense, let me tell you. 
Such intensity developed after the Babylonian exile of the people of Judah, especially after the rise of the Seleucid Empire and the revolution of the Maccabees. Many saw the world as an inherently evil place, one that God would judge at the proper time and deliver to destruction. People began to make more and more rules in order to stay on the straight and narrow. People often portray the book of Leviticus as God's big bad rule book, his, book good, his big book of do's and don'ts. But a clearer look at Leviticus, which by the way is fulfilled in Christ, a clearer look at Leviticus chapter 18 shows that what underlies the concepts of purity and impurity uh, within the body Leviticus 18, 1 through 18 talks about incest, which occurs primarily when a man uses his social and physical power to get a forbidden woman as a partner. The point here is that a man should set the example by loving and caring for his family as God has loved and cared for him. A man should love and respect his father like he loves and respects God. He should love and respect women because both God and his Father have protective oversight over these women. This acts like a guardrail to restrain sin. Leviticus 18 is all about a good father loving and teaching his son what he himself has received from God. When we get to Leviticus 18, verse 19, and hereafter, which talks about women during their time of uncleanness, adultery, child sacrifice, homosexuality, and bestiality, the whole point is not to harm the weak. All of these practices involve a strong man acting in a harmful way against a woman a child, a weaker man, and an animal. Jesus also hates the sin of being a bully. We do not know the exact circumstances in Mark 7 about why Jesus' disciples had not washed their hands. If they needed to wash, Jesus would have said something and told them to go wash up. What is likely the case is that the Pharisees were trying to attack Jesus by attacking him through his disciples. They were trying to catch Jesus in the trap of not teaching according to the community laws. Jesus, however, brings them back to the reason why the laws were made in the first place. Washing one's hands was supposed to remind one that the Lord's people are not of this world. They are sojourners. They keep away from worldly defilement while focusing on loving God and one another. But the Pharisees had changed this focus kind of into earning brownie points for God. They began to think about doing good deeds as earning righteousness for themselves before God and in front of other people. Some of this had to do with the bad feelings and the split between the Hillel school and the Shammai school. The latter were all about being visibly holy and having nothing to do with the Gentiles. And of course this led to the situation that fomented the Jewish revolt and the ultimate destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans. One way that they did this was to wash themselves and to do various other things, such as Jesus talks about them praying publicly, look how good I am, walking into the, the temple and saying, Lord, I'm glad that I was not born a Gentile or a sinner or a woman, things like that. Um, Basically, it became a show of, look at me, how good I am, how pure I am, how holy I am. But that's not what Leviticus is talking about. When we look at Leviticus 18, it is not about that dirty woman. 
It is about how the man should live as a loving, God-fearing man with his kin. It is about concern for others using cleanness to help guide that concern. That is why Jesus goes right to the heart of the matter when he cites Isaiah 29, verse 13, to say that the Pharisees make human rules to hide their fake holiness. Jesus makes reference to an abusive practice of the Pharisees. A loving son would care for his parents in their old age. He would take them into his home and care for them until they passed away. Yeah, they didn't have care facilities back in the day, understand. Uh, this was part of the commandment to honor one's father and mother because they took care of you when you couldn't take care of yourself. God treated violations of this commandment as a capital crime. He who violates this crime shall die. So this is a big deal. It is a lot bigger than washing up. Jesus points to a loophole that the Pharisees created. They allowed a son to take some of the resources that he would have used to support his parents and donate that sum of money, donate those resources to the Pharisees or scribes, and they would then interpret that as being donated to the Lord, thus Korban. The son could then leave his parents to suffer in poverty until they died. The son saved some money, uh, betting on the fact that maybe he could get rid of his expenses in one shot instead of drawing it out. And the Pharisees got a little richer. Everybody was happy, except the fact that the helpless suffered and died. And that didn't sit right with Jesus. Jesus here is not talking about secular laws as such, uh, but I would say that nothing really has changed in the past 2,000 years when it comes to secular laws. For example, in 1975, Congress passed the Magnuson Moss Warranty Act. It ensured that citizens had the right to repair any items that they bought. It's the idea that when you buy something, it's yours. Pretty basic, right? However, that seems to be changing. Remember, for example, when you could fix your own car? Remember when you took the TV or other appliances to the repair shop? or the repair people came out and fixed your stuff, and it was all good again. Yet, by the 1980s, like less than 10 years after this act, protecting consumer rights was passed, you had VCR makers begin to violate those rights with that, uh, that warranty void sticker that they put on the back of the VCR. That's, that was illegal. That was completely illegal. And nobody did a thing about it. And, uh, you know, phone manufacturers have made phones designed so where you can't repair them. It's, it's, it's almost impossible to, to fix phones or even have a third-party repair shop fix phones. It's, it's very difficult. They have, to, they have to jump through all sorts of hoops to do so. You can't hardly fix your own car anymore. And both your phone and your car will they spy on you and everything you do. And do you think this is actually legal? No. But nobody seems to enforce the law. Well, they are. There's a lawsuit in Texas, but we'll see how far that goes. Uh, but federally, the FTC isn't looking out for you like they're, they're paid to do. They're looking out for the people that give them their big fat you know, lobbyist checks. Uh, and when they uh, do enforce the law, the penalties are just rinky-dink. They have no effect on these corporations. The corporations are like, yeah, we'll pay the fine, and we'll keep shafting everybody else. The people who make and enforce the laws that are supposed to protect us, you and me, are all crooks who are bought and paid for. That's the secular world. It hasn't changed. It was crooked in Jesus' time. It's crooked now. Jesus knows that the secular world is hopeless. 
but he is focusing instead at religious figures because you know what? When it comes to the secular world, whether you're rich, you're poor, you end up in the same spot, right? But with religious figures, I mean, that affects your eternal life. And that's a lot bigger, that's a lot more important than the short life we have here. And these religious figures are supposedly acting in God's name, but they are still doing wrong things, just like the secular world, by twisting what was meant for our good into something that is self-serving and evil. But then that leads us to the question, what about us sinners? Because, <laughs> you know, what if we haven't been good enough? What, what if we kind of bend the rules to help ourselves out? What happens when we kind of don't live up to Jesus' expectations? Well, Leviticus 18 is about protecting the weak and guiding the strong. And that's, of course, going to transfer over into what Jesus is talking about in Mark chapter 7. You know, so many academics have interpreted uh, Leviticus instead as, oh, it's male patriarchy, it's, it's Judeo-Christian bigotry, and all this other stuff, as kind of like God beating up on the weak. But that is not the truth. In fact, the exact opposite is the truth. You know, but hey, sinners got to sin, and people will twist anyone's words. And all they're doing is following in Satan's footsteps. That's, that's it. But Jesus wants you to know that when he gives you words of law, he wants you to stop what you're doing, assess your situation, repent, and then Turn to his words of gospel. No. Jesus doesn't say, well, you better try harder. I won't love you. No. When the law strikes you and convicts you, you then turn to those words of gospel. God so loved the world that gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish. Shall not perish, but have eternal life. That is God's proper work. And whatever he does in the way of the law is always designed to guide you to the way of the gospel. Jesus is not a hoodoo man trying to confuse you into doing what he wants. That is what the devil is all about. Jesus says it straight. And his goal is your salvation. He became poor so that we might become rich. He knows that sin will turn your head away from the good things, just as it misled men into doing evil with the people that they were supposed to protect. But Jesus never acts through the words and deeds of evil people. Jesus called the Pharisees on the carpet for for all the little games that they were playing. And he used a whip of cords in the temple for the games that the money changers were playing. Jesus will have justice on those people who abuse their power to hurt others, especially those people who do it in the name of the Lord. And he will protect and nurture the weak. That is what Jesus, a real man, gives you in the gospel, his love, and his protection. Jesus does not beat you up. Jesus builds you up. But if you engage in behavior that he calls an abomination, he will not just sit by and do nothing. He will, however, forgive you, and he will help you to get back on track. He was willing to forgive those Pharisees if they wanted it, He's willing to accept people who had done wrong. He did it for so many, even of his own disciples. Look at Matthew, known as Levi, the tax collector, who had, had been a rabbi and then become a tax collector. And, and people looked at him and said, oh, you're just a sinner working for the Romans. And Jesus took him back and he changed. Zacchaeus, likewise, was a tax collector. Jesus turned him around. 
Jesus turned a lot of people around that nobody else would accept. He, he, he made them clean. He gave them the gospel. And he does that for us. He has washed us clean with his body and blood. And he delivers that cleanliness to you today. Jesus will help and support you and me until we come into our eternal, clean inheritance. That's what he is all about. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the one true faith, even unto life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole church of Jesus Christ on earth and for all people according to to their needs. Lord, we especially remember those who are feeling ill for various reasons, who are out with the, the flu or other viruses, or, or are dealing with some serious uh, health concerns. Especially remember those who are undergoing health care for acute conditions, those who are struggling with cancer, those who are dealing with chronic pain those who are dealing with dementia in their lives, and those with various and sundry health conditions uh, who are recovering or are just dealing with ongoing uh, issues and, and uh, trying to do the best they can and hopefully uh, get to a better place. Lord, we, we know that these are known to you, that uh, there are various conditions uh, their pains, their hurts, their struggles, they are known to you. And we ask you, Lord, if it, if it please you, if it be your will, remove uh, these burdens from them, uh, lighten their loads, and uh, help them have a full recovery. But Lord, in all cases, we ask you to be with them, help walk with them, and bear them up under their loads. Help give them the ability to, uh, to be positive, in the midst of all adversity, knowing that you, who want to love and protect them, have not given up on them, but rather are continuing to be with them each and every day and help them as they deal with their various struggles. Lord, in your mercy. In our prayers. We ask your divine guidance and protection to be with all who need to make important decisions, especially remember our military, first responders, medical caregivers, those who are in positions of authority, and those who are traveling. We ask you to be with the powers in conflict in our world at this time and, uh, and in all other situations that are uncertain. We ask you to give people eyes with the discernment to see and uh, that you give them your Holy Spirit to help clarify their minds and uh, uh, sharpen their judgments and lead their actions to be those that please you and go according to your will. Lord, in your mercy. Your For these and all other prayer requests, Lord, we set them before your throne of grace, trusting in your mercy. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Now sing the first two verses of hymn 781. We give the but I know. Give thanks to you, 
O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us in all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying,
that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy. You would strengthen us to the same in faith toward you and in firm love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee his